art and programming and juried exhibitions such as the semi-annual biennial. Um, all three of these artists were winners from the biennial, the 2019 biennial, uh, which was on view at the museum until we moved to all digital programming uh, in March. Uh, but you can take a look at the exhibition online. Uh, again, Adam's going to share a link with you all uh, to take a look at the, the new online gallery feature. And uh, you can learn a little bit more about Artist Alliance also on our website. So, okay, on to the program. Uh, Alan, Annalise, Michael, thank you so much for hanging out with me this evening. Well, <laughs> Annalise, nice let's, for having oh, us. it's so great. I'm really glad we <laughs> can great. do this. And, and I, I'm going to just, uh, again, uh, we were talking earlier this evening, but I love that you all have your artwork behind you. It makes for a really <laughs> um, colorful screen for, <laughs> for, for us all to look at where I'm just the nice uh, gray, nice born gray. Um, so Annalise, let's start with you. Uh, go ahead and give us a brief intro. Tell us a, a bit about yourself and your art. Sure. Yeah, so I live in the North Park area of San Diego, just east of the zoo. And coming this July will mark 10 years here in San Diego, which is amazing. Uh, I've been a professional artist for about 20 years now, though I've been expressing myself visually my whole life in one way or another. Um, I received my BFA in printmaking from the College of St. Rose in upstate New York. And that focused in intaglio etching techniques and silkscreen and lithography and relief. Uh, I'm also trained in sculpture, photography, oil painting, that sort of thing. So after I received my degree, I moved to San Diego. I had two sons and mothering happened. So art kind of disappeared for many years. <laughs> uh, and then in response to that, I started doing watercolor about six years ago because it's really easy to come in and out of. You can just set it down and then come back without a lot of fuss, um, which really set me up on the track where I am now uh, to where I, I think of myself more as like a visual um, poet or philosopher almost more than a visual artist per se, because all of my work is really um, concept driven where I'm trying to answer questions uh, that generally has to do with time, perspective, empathy, uh, and kind of answering what it means to be human. Um, so stylistically, I live somewhere between figuration and abstraction, and some call it kind of a dreamy, surreal style. And then my new thing I'm just getting into this year are cyanotypes and some lapidary work. Very cool, very cool. Yes, answering what it means to be human is, that's right. tackling some pretty heavy subject matter. <laughs> um, Ellen, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi. Um, well, let's see. I I live in San Diego near SeaWorld in the Bay Park kind of area right by Mission Bay. I moved here in 1989. I had been living in Europe for over 10 years before I came to San Diego. I actually grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. So I've been around and around in a lot of different places. I've been I've been creating since I was five and I always knew I wanted to be an artist, but it wasn't until 2007 or 2008 actually where I started practicing full time uh, and brought my studio, I'm, I work at home. And then in, at the same time, I also started living between San Diego and Honolulu. I spend half of my time in Honolulu and half of my time here. So I have a studio in both places, a gallery representation in both places. and and consider myself extremely fortunate for the life that I have today. Um, I work in mixed media. I use acrylics, I use um, house paint, I use paper, I use found objects found on the street. I've even put flowers in my paintings. Um, I originally painted in oil. I was basically an oil painter until the day I decided I wanted to paint really big and I looked at those little tubes of oils and those little brushes I had and said, this is not going to work. <laughs> so I opted for house paint and big brown pieces of, pieces of big brown paper, which is actually in the slideshow, you see a picture of me painting. It's on that brown paper. That's when I first started going wow. big. So um, yeah, really grateful to be here. Thanks for asking. Awesome. Me. Thanks. Cool. Michael, tell us about yourself. Thank you. Um, thank you, Katie, for inviting me and having me on a, a wonderful panel like this. This is really fun to do. I'm totally honored to be um, in, on the panel with 
you really wonderful artists. I, I was born in, in Greece and um, I came, we came to the States when I was six. We lived up and down the East Coast of the United States. My father's a priest, my grandfather's a priest. Um, uh, and uh, my, uh, uh, my family really comes from a you know, line of, of the priesthood and the church. We grew up, I grew up in the church, but uh, I, 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 I just wanted to be an artist when I, ever since I was a kid. And um, uh, we moved a lot. Uh, I went to Syracuse University, got my uh, painting degree there, uh, studio arts. Uh, and then um, moved to New York um, in between for uh, an exchange program. We went to, I studied in England for a year, two semesters at St. Martin's School of Art. And then I got my master's at LSU um, and uh, moved back to New York City and lived there for a while. And, and I think, uh, well, I was represented by a gallery there, Sandra Gallery. Um, but, uh, but then I, I think when I became 35, I had this sort of, uh, uh, midlife, uh, either crisis or awakening, whatever you call it, you know, uh, and and I uh, felt this sense of mortality about me, and I just uh, I just felt like I wanted something beyond what I was doing, and the priesthood was always calling me, uh, so I went to the seminary, got my uh, MDiv there, never uh, intending to stop painting because I, I just sort of feel like. Uh, my ministry is sort of an extension of, of who I am and what I do with my work, you know. So um, um, as a priest, I've been 25 years uh, painting also all during this time. In some parts, I would be showing where I lived. I lived in um, Alabama, Miami, um, Massachusetts, and then we moved here. I've been here for eight years. I live in Carlsbad. So um, um, as far as how I um, understand my work, I've always uh, gone back from uh, figuration to abstraction. And, um, and so uh, lately I've just been really working on these portraits. Uh, I, so I paint portraits that, of, of people that, that I love and know. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and so that's, you know, I, I don't know how you would uh, look, I guess my work is, is at this moment figurative. Yeah, yeah those are uh, the, uh, the two that we have in the biennial for you. They're, right. they're figurative and they're both, uh, they're both pretty recent, right? Yeah. 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 Right. yeah, yeah. Well, I love, I love the, the breadth of, uh, of, of, everything with our panelists we we all come from all over the U.S. and ended up in San Diego I think that's a a really good representation of kind of what our art scene is like we, we come from everywhere here in San Diego so we have all of these uh international and national influences uh kind of coalescing right here in this area um and, and you guys all have such completely different styles as well. Um, well, Michael, as the newest kind of newcomer to San Diego, and I know you, you moved here um, to take on your, your uh, position at the church, right? Um, right. Okay, right. so you moved here for the church and then you're, you're continuing to be a professional artist at the same time. So for how sure. are you finding um, the, the professional art scene here? How did you get a foothold uh, in, in the community here? Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that it was a God thing for me. Uh, um, I, you know, I got to, one of my parishioners uh, uh, passed away I, and, and I met uh, 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 Bill Georges, that was his mother. Um, and then uh, through that, I met um, uh, Kim, uh, Kim, um, Kim Lau, who is in the painting. And I met her husband, uh, Kim, um, I'm sorry. Jean Lau and Kim McConnell. Uh, and through that, I met uh, uh, Mark Quint and um, then, uh, then uh, Hugh Davies and, and Faye Hunter and his wife. And, and so that's, you know, um, I, that's sort of how I, I got to know just by, just by meeting people, you know, just being in the art scene, just sort of going to galleries and, does that jive with how you guys said uh, Ellen and Annalise experienced it? You kind of just meet people. I recognize 
all the names that <laughs> that Michael said as well? Uh, for me, it was different. I, um, I, when I first moved to San Diego, there wasn't a lot in 89. There wasn't that much going on. Um, I remember going to the San Diego Art Institute thinking it was a school and it was a gallery, but it was hard to um, uh, really approach it. But eventually I, and plus I was raising my daughter when I first got here. So, but when I first started uh, really trying to get out into the art world, it was the San Diego Art Institute in its prior iteration before they changed um, uh, direction. And we used to have regular shows, regular jury shows. I was part of, I was a member there for a long time and met a ton of artists and a ton of people. And then I ventured out to um, Oceanside Museum of Art and became an Artist Alliance member and showed and have showed with you guys for a number of years and met a lot of fantastic people. And uh, yeah, so for me, it was those basically those two big institutions and then approaching galleries and entering on, you know, shows in a lot of different other places too. So it's been, it's been a journey. It's been fun. Yeah, yeah. Then still on um, it. I'm still on, yeah, it. <laughs> I'm still still on, on it. that journey. One yeah. Foot in front of the other. <laughs> Annalise, how about you? Yeah, for me, um, I I think there is a lot going on in San Diego. There's so many creative, interesting people and events. I think it is. It's a little hard if you don't know where to look, I think it's hard to find those things. But then once you do, and again, you start meeting people, you know, it kind of starts unpacking and you can see that there really is a lot. Um, for me, since I was working in watercolor, I joined the Watercolor Society at Liberty Station and started showing with them. And, you know, it's like everybody's saying, you know, it's you meet one person that turns into three, it turns into, you know, it's like things just, but it's the human connection piece that's so critical because it doesn't matter how prolific you are or how talented you are. If you don't know anybody, it's not gonna work. <laughs> so right. yeah, just, you know, I had a great conversation with a fellow artist at the, um, the Art Alliance Biennial. And I just, you know, we just struck up a conversation and she actually lives in LA and had amazing information for me about trying to sort of worm my way into the LA art scene that I never would have gotten this, you know, reference to this arts institution or that if I hadn't just chatted with her. So. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. it. What I hear about is like, you just, you submit, you submit, you go to gallery shows, you try, try to get involved in as much as possible. And it's about networking and you meet, and it's not even necessarily meeting the right person. It's meeting a lot of people and learning from all of them, right? Because everyone's going to have uh, a, a different um, positions and ideas and connections. And it's growing that, well, growing those connections. And I think too, it's, it's not, it's a cliche thing, but you have to keep coming back. So let's say you apply for a residency one year and you don't get it, you apply again the next year, they might have a different jury panel. You know, it's it's a persistence yeah. thing too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I found that too, applying for shows, you gotta keep applying and going back. And I've, I've, I've entered shows where I've gotten rejected with the same piece of painting, with the same painting that I enter again and get Juror's Choice Award. You know, it's like, it's so subjective. So keep coming back, you know, you gotta keep, you gotta show up. So yeah. up and show up. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. So, well, how then, Annalise, how do you feel like this is, or uh, I guess, uh, Michael, let's go back to you. How has this kind of changed the situation that we're in now, Had changed how you're approaching the art and approaching um, getting your artwork out there? You mean the COVID? Uh, yeah, that's the situation. Is the elephant in the room? Um, <laughs> right. The, um, you know, the, the la I was just thinking about that last night, the, the, the self-portraits, the double portrait that I did. Um, I, I sort of, I, I get a sense that it's a little bit claustrophobic, you know? Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot going on in the painting. Um, and so that's, you know, I, I, and I also feel like this, um, uh, I, I try to, to give myself a deadpan view, you know, um, uh, um, you know, appearance, but, but I, I, I sense a little bit of worry in there, you know, and I think there's a little sort of a low level uh, kind of uh, angst that I'm feeling and that I, I suppose everybody else is feeling, 
you know, so I, I'm just, you know, just working as much as I can. Okay. Go back um, to the other one, Adam. Right. <laughs> That's there we right, go. that one. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I have yeah, what, what you see in this one is um, is a sheepskin rug with, with ping pong balls and a mirror with depicting myself uh, sort of out of focus. If you, if you if you cross your eyes, you'll see two images, and that's really what what it is. And I I really honestly don't know why I decided to do that, but. Um, but I, you know, it, it 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 popped into my mind, and I just couldn't let it go. So I had to just go with it. But um, I, but I guess that's what I'm kind of feeling, you know, um, a mixed mixed feeling, almost kind of in a way. I don't want to use the word grieving because it's too strong. But but it's it's sort of a loss of 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 a normal that that we don't have anymore, and we're sort of experiencing that all of us, you know. And um, so I think that that's sort of affected my work. Yeah, and, and I'm sure that it's affected everybody's work that in some way, you know. Right, definitely. Everyone is uh, being affected in, in different ways, emotionally right. and and uh, kind of more impacts, different impacts on our time. Annalisa, when we were talking earlier, you've told me about how uh, being at home with kids definitely uh, impacts how you work. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. I you know, I'm homeschooling two children now, and I'm not a trained teacher. So <laughs> that's been a huge learning curve. And it's meant that, you know, the school hours that I was able to be most productive in the past, I have to kind of squeeze creativity in wherever I can. So, you know, I, I luckily have lots of different ways that I enjoy making. So one of the things that I do is embroidery and I've been working on this huge embroidery for several years now. I don't you know, show so the I embroidery. Pick that up and, uh, you know, spend a couple of minutes in between math lesson and music lesson. Um, I'm an avid sourdough baker, so, which I consider super creative and therapeutic. So I do that in between school. So, you know, it's, it's I don't have the long sustained time that I had before COVID. Um, but I'm also trying to stick, I, I've already established a, an evening work routine that I've stuck to like glue because it's my sanity. So that hasn't changed with, you know, self-isolation. I still work uh, my same evening schedule and any weekend hours I can grab. Glue. Yeah. Do, do your kids like uh, making art with you? The, do they work with you or work, like making art at all? they're amazing they're so creative i was just you know we set up a little painting station out in the garden for them yesterday and they've just been painting away and they're making stop motion movies and they knit and they're musicians so they play piano. that's awesome they're amazing <laughs> they knit that's fantastic <laughs> alan what about you oh for me um yeah uh, I agree with the angst that Michael was talking about. There's a lot of that um, in in my head. Uh, my practice, as far as practicing, I'm on the same boat, similar to Annalise, having kids at home, uh, my grandson's at home doing the Zoom schooling, and my daughter, who teaches, she's doing her teaching. So I've gone back to painting at night, which I did when I was in school. I did when I was raising my daughter. I did when I was... Um, working full time. So it's, I love painting at night. The difference today is that um, I have to wake up in the morning early right. because of the, the kids. So I get lack of sleep here and there. But um, yeah, uh, I, I feel fortunate that my studio is actually at home. So I can pick up a brush whenever I feel like it. If I have a minute, you know, I'm, I, I, I'll take five minutes. I, I don't have to have an hour ahead of me to put something on my canvas. Yeah, so I think that's I actually, something to, to really like embody, like five minutes is okay. It does, you don't have to commit an hour or right. three hours or whatever. Yeah. Just just do five minutes, just do a minute in between like, different things. And as you right? say, I have my, it's like my, everything is here. So I'd be doing something and I'll see the pace. Oh, it needs a little bit of red over here. You know, and I just pick it up and go that way. And that, that drives me nuts. Maybe not with making artwork quite the same, but like, that that thing that needs a little bit more work 
I really got to stir the onions over here. They're going to burn, but that needs more work. Exactly. Exactly. It's like, oh, no, I can't tell you how many things I've burned right. <laughs> because of that. But, right. Yeah. Exactly. But, uh, no, but I also find that I'm painting. Maybe uh, I put this piece up because I'm working on it. I'm going to work on this for a whole year because I'm getting ready for a show at OMA in, two, in 2021, 2021 with TWA <laughs> and, um, it's interesting what this piece has started to be about, had it to do with, we are all the same, but different. So it has all the ovals that are the same. And then now with all the Zoom meetings and everything, I was already gonna incorporate these little pieces, these little um, faces in it. Um, I see all the faces on the Zoom. If I'm in a Zoom meeting, I'm drawing, I'm drawing like these little faces of the people mm -hmm. that are in oh the, my gosh in the that's meeting. so cool and they'll get a um applicate or collage into the painting eventually so it's kind of fun it's had um the creative aspect of zooming right <laughs> yes <laughs> adam show uh show some i think ellen has a couple of works with uh faces in them uh not quite the same i i ellen you didn't uh, send ones like with pasted faces in there no, I don't have the pasted faces that I sent uh, you, but I did that one when that was when I was beginning to paint late at night. I called it fast and furious late night painting. And that's what came out. It was just kind of like those people and, and they, um, they, you see the social distance in them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're keeping separate. They're keeping yeah. Separate. Um, and I, Annalise, I want to talk about one of your most recent artworks. Um, Adam, show us the one that um, there's kind of a grid in the background. Uh, it's, it looks like a really big, and there's an ocean with uh, cactuses. There we go. Annalise, tell us a little bit about this one. This is one you're, you're still working on. And how big is this? What is the scale on this one? I want to say it's 18 by 24. Okay. All right. And so for some reason, when I see this, I'm thinking like, oh, that's five feet by six. No. <laughs> Let's see if I can find one of my I'm sitting at my studio desk here. I was gonna see if I could find one of my paintbrushes. I, I oh. use a paintbrush that has about three bristles, like the oh. tiny little so it's very hard to go big when you use that tiny of a paintbrush with watercolor. Yeah. Yeah. But um yeah, so this piece I actually started last year, probably late last summer, early fall. Mm -hmm. And it's just so interesting how it has this very, the same meaning, but totally different now with COVID and everything we're dealing with. So the underpinning concept here is kind of that, that grid represents modern life or human life and all of its complexity. And I'm still filling out all of the squares, as you can see, but they're filled with iconography that have been made by humans over millennia from every nation, country on earth. I'm trying to represent as many different types of human imagery as I can. Um, and they all have different meanings. It could be a trickster or a God or feminine power or whatever, they all mean different things. Um, but what they're there for is to talk about kind of this overwhelming sense that modern life has of all of these things that we need to know and to do and places to go and just the busyness of life. Um, and then in the upper right corner, the red and blue imagery, they're all physics imagery in some way. There's um, big things, there's multiple dimensions, there's all kinds of physics things happening there that kind of represents an intellectual realm. Um, and then that tan area is more of an embodied realm. And then there are these two curved things kind of coming out of the embodied realm, looking over at the desert. And they're actually going to be kind of cartoon-like eyeballs looking over at the desert. And it's kind of this idea of longing. So right now, this piece is called the longing piece. That will probably change. But it has to do with this idea of being in a space that feels overwhelming or bigger than you can handle and longing for something else that's more pure and simple and manageable. So it's funny because now it feels so relevant, but it felt just as relevant when life was crazy for other reasons. 
you know? Isn't that so true? Like, yeah. yes, life is crazy right now. It's super crazy. But before this, wasn't it also still crazy? Life is, <laughs> it was just crazy for other completely different reasons. Um, I No, I love the the symbols in this. I love the, um, the, the shapes and how broad of uh, d- different cultural things are represented here. Um, yeah, this one is just really, I can't wait to see this one develop. Um, and uh, so Michael, I- I wanted to know, like, how how it is uh, the situation? How are you now considering your approach to new works? Like, what what's in the works that is uh, you're feeling like um, might might change in response to this? Uh, are you are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. All right. Um... I, Let's um, see a couple of his, or, or the, yeah, there we go. Right. One of, this is one of your earlier ones. It's such a, a, a colorful, joyful, <laughs> yeah, this, cheerful piece. That's, this was the one right uh, before the, the self-portrait, the double portrait. Um, this is a fae uh, hunter uh, and her dogs um, uh, and um, Tiger and Bell. They, the, um, I like to work in a trapezoid uh, shapes only recently I, well it's just it just kind of frees me up a little bit from uh, the uh, just you know from the perspective and, and you can see um, I like I love Cezanne and how he breaks up the space and also with the new technology now how things you can take a picture and you can zoom it in zoom it out and it changes its point of, of perspective and, um, and and all that you know that kind of comes into play also uh, because of um, uh, Byzantine iconography. There's there's a use of of reverse perspective, where whereby um, you know sort of like switching the binoculars and looking the long way. You know, um, in for the the use of enhancing the figure, changing the perspective to uh, to 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 bring up the figure. So in this particular uh, portrait, it, you know, I have Faye uh, sitting in a chair with the two dogs, and um, the the it's it's actually in her house with a reflection on the left side. And uh, as I was painting it, I was thinking of uh, you know Richard Diebenkorn, um, you know, and um, different artists would come up on the on the left very left side with. The dog's tail is that turquoise color. I don't know. I thought of David Hockney, one of my favorite painters, um, and um, you know those. So, so in terms of 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 where I'm going to go, uh, honestly, I, I think that I think I'm just going to keep painting portraits. Maybe I I don't know. Uh, for me, painting a self portrait is hard. <laughs> uh, but one that's one of the reasons why I did it, you know, uh, because I think this is sort of a time for, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, when I was looking at the self portrait, I, you you really sort of examine yourself, and 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 I don't see that person in the mirror, you know. I, I sort of like I want to I want to look at myself sort of like in a in, in a uh, more normal, better light. But when you're painting a portrait, you know, or, or self portrait. I really have to be honest, and and in that honesty, you sort of feel, oh, you know, do I do I really look like this or like that, you know? So I, I don't know whether I'm going to keep painting portraits uh, or um, you know, uh, or just figures. I'm, I might go back to painting my kids, you know. And and one one good thing that I uh, because I'm I'm a priest and I do have an income, uh, I don't have to be too concerned with selling my work, although selling is good, <laughs> um, you know, but um, the direction I'm, I'm coming, I, I, I don't know, uh, Katie, that's mm-hmm. a really good, really good question. Yeah, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll all see how, uh, how this is changes the, the art world um, moving forward, how sales change, how we uh, conduct sales, how yeah. we think about our artwork. Um, like everything could change or maybe we will be surprised by how how things just morph into our new reality um 
it, it'll be real. I'm excited to, to see how things are going, how things go. Um, Annalise, we have a question for you. So uh, your pieces are so concept driven. How do you communicate these concepts with with the viewers without, you know, um, talking one on one like this? How can uh, people um, see behind your artwork when you're not there? It's a great question. It's when I'm still kind oh, of- Oh yeah, Adam, I like the blue ones. Go on to the cyanotype, or this is good too. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I'm still trying to figure it out. You know, I think there's such a, a balance between the art itself, what you see, the visual interface and reading, you know? And I, I think there, I've had strong suggestions before to write, you know, kind of explanations of each piece. Um, but, it, you know, it's like, then you don't want to take away or, or have, you don't want to explain too much and then it ruins some of the mystery, you know? So I think it kind of depends on the piece for me. Some of my pieces have so much physics, for example, um, this piece behind me, a big part of it is quantum entanglement, but you would never know unless I told you that there is a prism splitting photons and it's this, you know, metaphor and analogy for empathy, you know? <laughs> So you, it kind of depends on the piece, but you know, I'm trying to figure out a good way to, to make it, my whole point is to get my message to the audience. And if they look at, look at it and they think it looks cool, but they don't know what it means, then I've only done half of my job. So I don't know, I'm still trying to figure that piece out. There Oh no, I think we're losing Annalise. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no, yeah, Annalise, your internet may be, might be going out. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, I think you're back. I think okay. you're back. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, it, yes, in the end, it, uh, it's a work in progress. But I also think that when looking at your artwork, Annalise, it's, uh, it's recognizable. I can see what's going on and it has an emotional impact, even though I might not know the full story behind it. Uh, I, it, you know, I can say, oh, these cyanotypes that are on the screen right now, they're so dreamlike. I can identify with symbols in my dreams or something like that. Now, Ellen, uh, same question for you. Like how, how do you communicate um, the, the concepts behind your work and uh, all of the different uh, ideas behind it? This, so one, I, this I, one's pretty, this is like pretty this. crazy. So this one we talk about my, I started this painting with my grandson. This is something that was on the wall that we were all painting. So I think of my work as um, a lot of it, especially the, this particular style, style is as storytelling, but I don't necessarily know what the story is. So um, the painting can reveal it to me or, or the viewer. I like to leave it open. Um, I'm, when I paint, I really am thinking a lot more about the formal qualities, about color, line, shape, balance. I'm always looking for balance in, in both um, tonal qualities and in shapes and having differences, having things that you see from afar and that bring you in close. Um, whether it's painting a horse and a person or an abstract, I'm always going for that same kind of effect and don't always know. Now the piece that's at um, Oceanside, that was, that was more conceptual in the beginning thinking about, I was thinking about that whole concept about how we are all the same, but different. You know, we're all made, every single one of us on this earth is made from bone and blood and skin and organs. But depending on where we grow up and who our parents, you know, our parents, we're all different. And I love embracing those differences. So these oval paintings, the ovals represent, you know, the skeleton, you know, our, our basic being, and then all the treatment around the ovals shows our differences. And um, I, there's only a few paintings that I've painted in my lifetime that I can go on and on about like those paintings and talk about. Usually it's, it's like I'm, I'm painting and I would like more the viewer to tell me what they see in it. 
if that makes any sense. It totally makes sense. <laughs> and like, now since color is such a really strong part of your work, are you finding that your color palette is changing over the last few weeks? Uh, it is. It is. How, how is it changing? How's it's, it different? It's getting lighter, which is, um, I, I go to this place where in my work, I don't want to necessarily, necessarily show the darkness. I'm a happy person. I um, am a positive, happy person. So when I'm in my studio, I want to have fun. You know, I was like, what is, I mean, fun, it's not always fun. It's a challenge and it's arduous, but sometimes it's fun. I'll be doing something. Oh, this feels good. So I want to do more of that, you know, or that color, look what that color looks like next to this one. Oh, that's pretty cool. So I'm, um, it's always an experiment. There's the painting that's up now has, I could not tell you how many layers underneath it. It is so heavy because I have, I'm, <laughs> Two weeks ago, it, that striped part at the top was a fence. It was upside, it was the other way around and there was a horse, but I flipped it upside down, took the horse out and added a person and a dog. So I'm just, I'm on a journey in all my paintings, kind of like yes. going for a walk. It's like, ah, I don't know what's going to happen next. I love that. I love that. <laughs> even, even the artists don't know where it's going to go. And then you, you end up there. Then, like, how do you know you're done? Uh, you know, someone just said that to me on, on uh, social media and they said they, um, someone said to her, a artist, a painting is never done. It just gets abandoned. There you go. I told her, and we were talking about this specific piece and I said, you know, I need to abandon this piece because it's just getting too heavy. I can't think of it. Oh my God. Uh, well, Michael, uh, I have a question for you. Um, I was, we were wondering, and there's a question in the chat box. Was Hockney your favorite artist before moving to California? Um, was he always an influence or is he a newer influence since uh, being here and with all our our sunlight. I, I've always loved Hockney, always, um, ever since I saw his work. I met him twice, <laughs> uh, only, oh, only, by, only by chance, uh, one, once at the Whit Whitney and then as he was opening the door for me at the uh, Metro Pictures in, 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 so in New York. Um, wow. So he was opening uh, the door for you. How? Well, Sorry, that's really cool. Only, that's just random. Uh, only because he was there and I, you know, he was just a nice guy. I mean, um, but but he, you know, I, I love this. I love his work. Um, you know, I, I I think he's an amazing painter. I love his playfulness, his you know the lightness, but you know, but yet the sincerity and the honesty in his work. So um, I get what you're seeing here. I guess mm -hmm. on the screen is uh, Hugh Davies, and the painting that he posed for is where I'm sitting now. So this is the ah, painting. So that behind. is the painting that is, that's currently behind you. Yeah. Right. So it's the it's the exact painting that you pose in front of. Um, th so um, I did a series of abstractions that I called abstracted souls, uh, because a lot of, there was a time in my community where many people of my friends were passing away, and, I, and the, the grief I sort of had to answer in some way, in sort of abstract sort of way. Um, and I started painting these green blobs you know, on, on a, a color field and those green blobs sort of connected each other and I sort of saw them in my uh, understanding as, as souls, you know, um, and, um, and, and as the paintings progressed and you have these colors behind them and as I was, um, I was, uh, and, and so as I was um, painting these images Michael, um, would, I, okay. I, sorry to interrupt you, but your video seems to have cut out. Is um, is that something on our end, Adam, or do you think that's something on on Michael's end? I don't know. It's a little on on Michael's end. Um, oh dear. I, no, I wouldn't let it sidetrack the conversation. Right. Yeah. Everyone who's uh, watching, just imagine the thing that's behind Hugh Davies is behind <laughs> Michael. <laughs> All right, Michael, go ahead. Okay. okay. Um. Cannot. All right, uh, I think it says you cannot start your video because the host has disabled it. <laughs> okay, um, so um, the, um, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I can hear you, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, all right. So, I, so if you're looking at this, as I was painting these abstractions, um, Different artists would come to mind that, that I liked, right? On the, on the, I don't, you see, there's a 
Brancusi sort of imagery. And in some parts of the painting, there would be Hockney, there would be um, uh, Matisse, you know, um, you know, and, and so, uh, and, and, and right, that guitar is, is a Picasso influence. Um, and so, um, I, you know, the kind of, these paintings took me uh, to a point where I just didn't, couldn't go anymore. And, and, um, and I used them by accident as kind of backdrops for these portraits because I wanted to paint my kids. And um, because I hadn't painted a, a, a picture of my family since 2008. And I thought, well, you know, uh, maybe it's, it's time to do another one. But I, uh, um, so, so I did this, the, um, use these paintings as a backdrop. So what happened was I would paint the abstraction twice in front of the painting. So I would paint the image and then the abstraction again. And so the interesting discovery was the, the, the abstraction would become, the first time I painted it was really um, um, exploratory, you know, like a journey. Um, the second time I painted it became meditative. And it was a kind of interesting sort of juxtaposition of, of these two images. They look the same relatively, but the uh, attitude of them is different. And, um, and, and I like the idea of sort of that was a way that I could fuse, fuse the abstractions that I was doing with the portraits that I love to paint. Uh, and so that's the, uh, that's the reason why this, this image, I, I, I'm sitting in front of the image that you cannot see. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, tech. Hey, this that happens. That's, that's okay. Uh, all the better. Yes. Oh. Yeah. All the better. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, so, okay, here's a, a more broad question from the Q&A, um, Annie. Um, how do you think networking will change? How will you do a different kind of networking now that we're a little more digitally based rather than getting all together in a room? Annie, Annalise, let's start uh, with you. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I know as a as a consumer of this kind of thing, I've loved how amazing it has been to connect to artists just through social media uh, and various you know things like this. Mm -hmm. You know, they're incredibly intimate but expansive at the same time. Which you know, if this is a new format, and nobody has really done this in this way before, and I think the audience, the public in general wants to be engaged with art. They want to understand, they want to, you know, know what's going on. But I think a lot of people feel intimidated by art because they don't understand it. And I think that a lot of the things I'm seeing now, like this even, it, it lets you in to see the individual, their space maybe um, in a way that's totally different. You know, I, there's a, a jeweler that I really like and on her, Instagram, she's been doing these studio tours of all of these other jewelers. And so every day Aww. she posts a new person. Her name is Sienna Patti, I think. Piatti. Sorry, I don't have a link to give you, but Sorry. <laughs> it's been really cool to, to get a super direct um, streamline into these artists' mindset and their space, which I don't think had this self-isolation happen, we wouldn't have such intimate views into people and makers and I agree I yeah go away I think people like this and they'll keep wanting this I'm hoping so too I'm hoping this is really uh not just made it a temporary pivot for how we interact with each other and with our artists I'm really hoping this is a permanent move to new ways of engagement um I know at, at OMA like We've been talking about wanting to get our exhibitions more prominent on our website for a long time, but it's never been a huge priority. We just have to get them on the walls. So let's get them on the walls before we get them on the, the website. Well, now that is a huge priority. And so we've done it. And now we can do it forever. All of our exhibitions can go online. And I love what you're saying, Annie, about like, getting onto Instagram and seeing what everyone is producing on there. and. Also, don't be afraid, everybody, to just reach out. See an artist you like, ask them a question. I think artists love 
uh, speaking for as not an artist, I love answering <laughs> questions. So, <laughs> you know, just reach out and start asking questions um, to anyone whose artwork you love to see. Um, and again, sorry, shameless plug for OMA. Our Artist Alliance, um, it, we are uh, starting to do coffees and conversations which was a sunday <laughs> a sunday event that was at oma on our free sundays for sunday of every month and now we're doing them online so you can join a go-to meeting um kind of like this you can share your artwork um it's from noon to two uh every first sunday so that's this sunday uh just just come join it's actually it's not these ones aren't just for artist alliance since it, it's a uh, kind of just something we want everyone we want the whole community to come join so um maybe adam you can send a, a link uh, afterwards in the emails for how people can join uh, our networking thing on sunday um yeah, ellen same like say how are you finding new ways to network digitally network from home um I, it, well, the same thing, a lot of the same thing of what Annalise said, and um, I love that you can, I, I haven't really reached out, I haven't had a lot of time to, to do what I normally do with what's happened, what, the way my house is, but um, yeah. <laughs> I have been, I've thought about it a lot and think that uh, I love what's happening too, I love what Oma is doing with these artist talks, I have in the past gone on to different um, podcasts and listened to artists, but now to be able to see them too and see the studios, I've listened to the the other two talks that you guys had and some of the, um, and some of, uh, oh shoot, her name is escaping me now, but the lectures, Robin, Robin Douglas. Robin Douglas, Douglas Robin yeah, had, Robin Douglas's you know, lectures. Fantastic. And, you know, I, I think it's, I, I can't wait to get back together and, and be in a room with people. I really miss that. But I, this is a great addition to what we've been doing. We have all been learning so many new ways of doing things. You know, I have been, I've definitely put more videos out of my process than I had in the past. So maybe that's one way, you know, I've sent things to my galleries about me painting and and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. I I um I'm like you, Katie. I'm I think it's there's a lot of silver linings in in what happens anytime. You know, yeah. I, like to, I like to be the person to look for the good and yeah, be, yeah. be grateful for the the little things that we can be grateful for. So exactly. Like yeah, a lot of the chat in the chat box is saying, you know. This is actually making it easier to access art. Now all the artists have to put their artwork out there digitally. And so for people who Good. can't get out to the museums or maybe, um, you know, people living in New York have a hard time coming to OMA every week as yeah, they want to. So and now they can. Right, and we can get into the other galleries. And also, I mean, I'm going to do a plug for OMA and the coffee talk. I went to the last one on the, the digital one. It's the first it's the first coffee one that I've been to because you, I am down in San Diego. You're far away. Yeah. You're like an up hour in away Oma, uh, up in Oceanside and, and I just haven't made it. And then it was online. It's like, Oh my God, I can go. It was so great. And I will be there this weekend. Um, so oh, that's awesome. That. Yeah. I'm just, I'm catching up with like uh, trying to read the chats at the same time and pay 100% attention to everything everyone is saying. I know. I'm it's a good trick some, to learn. I'm looking at some of them. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, 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 go, go ahead, Ellen. What were you saying? I know. I saw a question for me about my color and a book or, or books or anything like that. Yeah. Like who are, who are your influences uh, on your very unique artwork? Like, who have you, who's, uh, so I, I look at I look at a lot of art. I was originally inspired by George O'Keefe way back when, when I was 14 years old. She was my first, the first artist that I really loved. But um, Joan Mitchell, uh, you know, a lot of the names that have been up here. I look at a ton of art, but in the end, I just, it's like, I just go paint what I feel like painting. Right. Um, I don't, I don't, I haven't really tried to, well, maybe a long time ago, I would try to paint like other artists, but I don't mm -hmm. know how. I just don't know how. <laughs> I can't do it. So I have to just paint what I paint. Um, and then there was also a reference to a book and I know, I know where the question comes from. And it was this book called Ninth Street Women, which is a um, like kind of a 
a, a excellent book on history of the abstract expressionist uh -huh. artists. Mm -hmm. and definitely all of them were my idols. So, yeah. Well, um, I wonder now, um, since we're getting close to the end, Michael, tell us, where can we see your work? And is there anywhere in real life that we can see your work? Or uh, where can we find it online? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, all right. I, I have an Instagram account, Michael Soteris, um, Facebook. I have a, a website, michaelsoteris.com. Michaelsoteris.com. Um, cool. Right. Um, you know, um, um, I'm, I'm working on maybe a, a show somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I have, like you asked the question, where, you know, where, what direction am I going? I, I, I really don't know. But, but whatever that is, hopefully in a year or two, I'll have enough work that, uh, that I can show. Um, I think there was, a, I don't know how much time, I don't want to take, you know, any more time. You probably don't have, yeah, you got five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Can I explain the, the family portrait? Yeah, yeah, please tell us about the family portrait. Yeah. Adam, can you bring the family portrait up on, on the screen? Thank you, thank you for um, giving me this time. The, this family portrait, this painting in the back, the abstract painting um, is, ah. is, you know, I had, you know, I told, <laughs> you remember it, it's sort of a backdrop for the portraits. And it was on my studio wall. And I had my kids uh, kind of all sort of pose in front of it. And, and the, 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 the abstract painting sort of defined how I can, how I design the painting uh, compositionally. So it's sort of like a V with my daughter's uh, leg coming down and then the, the figures to my, you know, on the, on coming up to my wife. And so there's this sort of V Defying gravity kind of shape that you know, that I sort of based the uh, the painting on, but also uh, I was thinking very much of of Cezanne when I broke up the spaces, and so when I when I paint each time I just do a section at a time, and it kind of has to work as a section. So if the perspective whatever works better in in a section, then I use it, and hopefully it works as a whole. But that's that's pretty much what how um, how I design the painting. So it has natural light. It has different kinds of uh, light sources. Um, but you know, those are my children and, and my dogs. Uh, bubble wrap on 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 the right. You can see. But it's um, and and this this table it, that my daughter is sitting on um, is uh, uh, is actually. Um, uh, an antique table when I had a show at St. James Episcopal Church last year before, uh, or, or, you know, or actually when, when, when I had a show there, um, someone came in, I think he was this homeless guy, he used to be a, an antique dealer, and he said, what is she doing on that table? It's, a, it's an expensive table. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, so I used that table and all those, those sort of things and, um, Oh, Michael, I, I hate to interrupt. We just have a couple more minutes. We're going to have to wrap it up. And Ellen and Annalise, if you, if you can do it in like 30 seconds, if, can we see your artwork anywhere live or uh, we'll just share your website and your uh, social media in, a, in, in an email after this? I, I actually have work at Edelman Fine Art Gallery in Little Italy. Um, you can peek in the windows. I have work at Fresh Paint Gallery in La Jolla. You can peek in the windows. I have Work at OMA. You can see it online. <laughs> um, I yes, have... all three of these artists come visit their exhibition online. <laughs> Art and Soul on 101 in Encinitas. You can peek in the window. Oh, actually, all these places also will make um, appointments. Cool. They Good. will make yes. an appointment if you need to. Good. And then, of course, all my social media, Facebook, blah, blah, you know. Yes, yes, you can yes. Post the list. And for me, I'm, I also have some pieces at OMA and then otherwise I'm totally virtual. I have a few things that could materialize, but we just have to kind of wait and see what happens with the rest of this mystery that we're dealing with. But yeah, AnnaliseNeal.com has all my work. And if you want to reach me for any reason, you can 